The most intimidating teacher I've ever had was a person by the name of Dr. Hauerwas. He was a, a notorious curmudgeon. He taught at Duke at the seminary there. And he was the son of a Texas bricklayer with a work ethic and language to back that up. I could tell you some of the words he used, but we'd be having a PPR meeting shortly thereafter if I did. <laughs> Suffice it to say, he was not a pastor. He did not regard it as his job to be a pastor. His job was to sharpen the minds of people who would dare to be pastors such that they would never uh, be soft or easy in their thinking, that they would be as sharp and, and take, as a, take, serious, take worship as seriously as it needs to be handled. And so, walking into his class, you, you know it's going to be crazy. Is you walk in, and uh, I, I, the first day of class, I sat as far back as I could, like I was leaning against the back wall. I, I'm I'm a back pew lurker, and, and so that, that's where I was. I was, and, and he comes in, and he says. He, He's kind of, he has a kind of a nasal twang with a, a, a Texas drawl with a very nasal voice. And uh, he, starts, he starts out and he says, Christian ethics in one minute is never lie. And how do you live so that you don't? Like, and we're expecting, this is like an amazing world-renowned professor, and we're expecting, he says, like, this is Christian ethics in one minute, and we're all, like, ready to write down some amazing thing, and he says, don't lie, and we're thinking, huh? But he was right. I mean, we, we spent the rest of the semester figuring out, chewing on, what does it mean to live as followers of Jesus such that we can be a community that dares to tell the truth even when lies are comfortable, even when lies are what we're used to. We get cer certain lies we just get really used to. And, and worship being the central place where we gather to tell the truth. And, and the most true story we have to tell is the story of the God who having raised the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt, then raised his son from the dead. Uh, everything that we live that is true is a reflection and is based out of that story. And, and so... To say that to tell the truth is challenging and it's, it can be disturbing is something that we have, many of us have experienced. For many of us are old enough to remember when the United Methodist Church did not ordain women, right? And can you think about, like, what would it have been like the first time someone in the Methodist Church said, you know what, I think we should ordain women. You think that went over real well in the rest of the room? You think everyone went, yeah, cheers, let's do it? Right? This week, I, I couldn't have planned this better, and I'm sad to tell you this story, but this week I was told of a story at, at a previous church I've served uh, of uh, someone leaving the church because a woman showed up as a pastor as their pastor. Like, it is, and it's to tell, because we, we say, like, we believe it to be true that women should be pastors. And you can, we, this, is a, this is a debate, right? Uh, women should not have authority over men. But in Christ, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. And how do we live as a community that tells the truth and lives the truth most fully? That, that's not an easy challenge. It, it can be rather uncomfortable. I, I think we can get very uncomfortable when people start telling the truth. For, First of all, just because certain topics are awkward. Right? I am sure all of us have received that kick under the table, that nudge in the ribs, that moment where a, a wife or a mother or a dad or someone has given you that sort of, stop it. And, and every family does it a little bit differently. Every family has that one person who will start saying it, and it's, it's true, but that's not polite. Stop talking. You can get uncomfortable, right? Start talking about the truth. It is sometimes something we just don't want to hear, we don't want to grapple with. And it can, starting to tell the truth can lead us to places where we don't want to think about going. We don't, re, we, we don't know where it might go. Like just this week, I had this experience of... Um, Michael Jackson, there was a documentary that was released about Michael Jackson called Leaving Neverland. Have you, anyone heard, heard about this over this last week, right? Now, my mama has a signed LP of Thriller 
in the house. I was raised on Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson and Paula Abdul, and I know all the words to all the songs, including Madonna. I can sing all of Madonna's catalog, and it is vaguely disturbing, I admit. Uh, but like, I was raised on that 80s pop, right? And there's always been stories floating around that Michael Jackson and small children, a little bit weird. Well, this documentary came out, and it's four hours. I'm not going to spend four hours doing anything at this point. For, for I mean, I don't have that type of time. But there was a 30-minute sort of discussion of it. And as I looked at my phone and said, that I should listen to that, I paused and I thought, if I hit play and I hear something that is true, I might not be able to listen to this music the same. Right? I'm, I'm going to have to grab if, there's, if I hear something profound and... and well, I did. And it's easy to start, and you start thinking to yourself like, you know, it's just people trying to get the money, they're just trying to get the attention and, and just dismiss it, and, and instead to take the time and to listen. I, I spent the half hour to listen, and well, it's hard. To be willing to practice telling the truth demands a willingness as individuals and as a community to be uncomfortable with things that we don't yet fully understand. To be able to hold things in tension takes practice. And we can't do it all the time, but we can, do it, we can do it a certain amount of the time, because you can't be uncomfortable all the time, but we can do it for a season. And so welcome to Lent. This is the season where we grapple with some things that are uncomfortable. We are going to be practicing speaking the truth and seeing where that leads us on, on some topics that are challenging. The only reason we can dare to do this is we read what Jesus has to say in John 8 to the disciples. If you continue in my word, you are my, my disciple and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right? We, we dare to tell the truth because Jesus tells us the truth will set us free. So, here we go. If you go back to the beginning in Genesis, uh, we read that God creates humanity. God creates Adam out of Adama. Adama is the word for earth or, or, or dirt, and, and Adam is the word for humanity, though it's translated in, in English as Adam. And so Adam, sort of the humanity, created out of the dirt, out of Adama, uh, filled with the Spirit of God as God breathes into it. Spirit and, and breath are the same word. Adam is split into man and woman, ish and isha in Hebrew. And we, the way that it's translated in English, it talks about how uh, Adam, humanity, is put to sleep and then a rib is removed. And it's unfortunate that y'all eat a lot of ribs because when you hear the word rib, you think singular rib, just one like one spare rib. That's not, real, that's not actually the word. The word is side. It's more like side of ribs, as in like the whole side is split. So Adam is split into two sides, two halves, man and woman. And, and that, this is where Jesus talks about how in the, the two sides let, uh, come together and form one. It's two halves coming back together to form the one wholeness of humanity in, in marriage. And marriage is this wonderful gift, and it's, marriage has been understood over the centuries by the church to be for the, 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 the best place to, to accept the gift of children. It is the place to uh, have companionship, and marriage is the place where we, we work towards each other's sanctification. It is in marriage that we, we are practicing for the kingdom of God. Because it's, it's one thing for the, to practice for the kingdom of God where we, we love our enemy. It's an, it, it gets a little bit closer to home when we're sitting, laying next to someone and, and that person is snoring and I really just need to get some sleep. That's when forgiveness gets a little bit more practical, right? And, and so marriage is the place where we learn to practice forgiveness and patience and humility and, and service. And so... A married couple, as happens in many ways in life, can show us a glimpse of the love of God and what it looks like when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And we live in a broken world. We share in its brokenness. And that means that we have to grapple with when marriage breaks. Divorce. It's not particularly pleasant to talk about divorce. Lord knows I don't particularly enjoy it. I am fully aware, I was fully aware as I was writing this sermon that there are people divorced in, in this church in, in Honeywell. Like, I, I, this is not, this, this causes me to, to get kind of nervous, but it's, it's true, right? Talk about the truth, you get nervous. 
Jesus had to uh, deal with divorce 2,000 years ago, just as we do today. And I killed my mic. Jesus has to deal with this uh, 2,000 years ago, just as we do today. And, and in Jesus' day, there were two broad groups, two broad approaches to uh, divorce. Rabbi Hillel taught that a man could divorce a woman for just about anything. You're snoring, you're out. Right? Rabbi Shammai, was, in his school, was teaching that it had to be adultery, or else you couldn't get a divorce. Jesus, as usual, does not say, give a simple answer. I agree with Rabbi Hillel, and that's that. Uh, instead, he talks about how things should be when questioned about divorce. He starts out by pointing out that divorce was a concession to the hardness of hearts. Hardness of hearts. The heart is understood as being the center of the person, the emotions, and the thinking in, in the Jewish culture. And, and so... The heart is the center of any relationship, of the covenant of marriage, and uh, it is the, Jesus is talking about it in this covenantal way, and it's why we've read Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy describes the covenant between God and God's people. It's the same type of thing, how, how Israel, what does the Lord require of you? To serve the Lord your God with all of your heart, right? Love, yet the Lord set his heart in love upon your ancestors, and so circumcise then the foreskin of your heart. Do do not be stubborn any longer. That's the call of Deuteronomy. Don't have a hard heart. It, it, the Bible puts it in a rather earthy fashion. But don't, don't be stiff-necked. Don't have a hard heart. Be marked at the center of, of who you are as a person that follows God. That's the covenant of God and God's people. And, and in the same way, that marriage covenant... It is, it is rooted in being uh, have, loving someone out of your heart, and if you are hard-hearted, well, that doesn't make, marriage just doesn't work, right? It, it makes sense if someone is hard-hearted and stiff-necked, it's hard to be married to that person. Like, if the purposes of marriage are to raise children, accept, uh, give companionship, and help each other become better Christians, it, it's hard to do that with someone who's a jerk. If someone's hard-hearted, if someone is stiff-necked, it is almost impossible to be family with someone who is acting in this manner. When the heart is hard, it is not a surprise when the two do not become one. Like the marriage is two woman and man come together and they become one. And what Jesus says is when the two become one, let no one separate this. But if one of them has a hard heart, then the two didn't become one, did it? Right? It is my understanding of divorce that divorce does not do anything. It tells the truth about something that's already happened. Divorce is not breaking a marriage. Divorce is naming that one or both parties involved in a marriage are hard-hearted and it's already dead. Divorce is telling the truth about what is broken. And this can be very uncomfortable to tell, because if you think of everything that we, get, we have wrapped up in marriage, like you, you had the wedding, you spent a lot of money, you stood in front of the church, everyone showed up and like, you got pride wrapped up in it, right? You got married. <coughs> all, all the family that's wrapped up in it, you know, like you've, you've made this commitment with all, all your family, all your friendships, the married couples who you know, the, the finances, just the practicality of it. Like if you're trying to unwind finances from, from another person, the children, it is hard to tell the truth when a marriage is dead. It is tempting to pretend. It's tempting to just get used to it, to just, just kind of gut through it and say, we're just going to do it. And I, I've heard people say, we're going to keep on doing this for the children, right? You know, if it's dead, you're not doing it for the children. You're just teaching the children what a dead marriage looks like, what hard-hearted marriage looks like. I don't think that's really helping the children at that point. I think the role of the church in such situations is rather clear. It is to grieve with those who are lamenting the death of something. Talking to people who go through a divorce, I've heard this phrase that there's a mourning, there's a grieving for something that died. Because like, there was all the hope, you got married, and it was going to be wonderful, and then it isn't. 
All right? And so to grieve with those who are broken and hurting, to walk with them as family, not to pile on, there's already enough shame going on in such situations, but simply to be with people who are hurting. And maybe there's a practicality of it to uh, welcome people who are losing their church. I have watched people get divorced, and it is not often that both of them can stay in the same church. And so to be a church that can welcome someone who is divorced from another church and to say, you are, you are welcome here. Right? We, that was hard, and we're here with you and for you. To be the family that can help people deal with the, the logistics of, of divorce, like children, child care, that all gets very complicated and hard. And so the church is the place that helps people be safe in telling the truth of this. And the other aspect of this is to be able to tell the truth when someone wants to think about getting married again. All right. uh, the statistics are... You've heard half of marriages end in divorce. That's not the whole picture. 50% of first marriages end in divorce. 67% of second marriages. 73% of third marriages. What's that tell you? Right? Uh, I come from a background that is, has a bunch of workaholics. Like, I am completely capable of going and having lunch after worship with you all, and then going into my office and working all afternoon. It would be very comfortable for me. I could do it in a heartbeat. Would it be healthy? No. My instincts on working are horrible. I should not trust my instincts on how much I should work during the week. Because if I go with my instincts on how much I work during the week, it will leave my wife alone and my children without a father. Right? And so I depend on people who have a healthier sense of how much work I should do to keep me in check because my instincts are bad on that matter. And so when it comes to divorce and remarriage, it's the same thing. If you were divorced once and you're going to get remarried, out of love for that person, it's the same question. The same way that my PPR needs to ask me, Andy, are you working too much? We need to be able to ask people who have been divorced and say, why is this going to be different? Like, your instincts might not be act good on this. Your instincts might not be healthy. What comes naturally might not be good for you. And that's an uncomfortable conversation, isn't it? I have said that to people before, and I, oh, I hate it. But out of love for others, I can't not say it. Right? I love you, so let's talk about this. Is this going to be different, and why? We, do, we have these uncomfortable conversations risking to tell the truth about, divorce, about marriages when they're broken and when people are, are looking at being remarried because it is even worse to allow people to be stuck in marriages that truly are dead or to run back into something that will just break them again. We tell the truth even when it's uncomfortable because we love, it, we love each other. And because I love you so much, I will tell the truth, even when it is hard, and I hope you'll do the same with me. Amen.